Welcome back, everybody, to the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. This is our fourth meeting together. And I'm going to start with um, just a few housekeeping notes and introducing today's topic. And then I'll turn things over to Carla Myers. So first, I would like to thank all of you for your feedback so far about units one through three in the Open Textbook Publishing Curriculum. If you have not shared any feedback yet, please do now. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, a couple of you noted that links were not um, working for you, and I really appreciate you letting me know, and I apologize for any broken links. I did discover when um, doing some cleanup that I think it could have also been a timing issue because there were several links that I checked that worked fine, um, particularly from BC campus. So sometimes, I don't know, it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on, but um, I do appreciate those notes and feedback. And for the person who's frustrated in the quizzes when I don't say select all that apply, I really think that I have done that and every quiz question now includes select all that apply when applicable. <laughs> Um, here in the chat is a link to the feedback form. As you can tell, I do look at the feedback, I do incorporate it, and I appreciate all notes, big and small. So just to remind you where we are in our orientation together, we started with an introduction to open textbooks and how they're different from monographs. We talked about how to build accessibility and inclusion into them from the beginning. And the key takeaway from that first meeting was really that considering accessibility from the beginning will not only make your open textbook more usable, but it will save you work later on, which is an ongoing theme that will also come into play today. We've also talked about planning and building your publishing program by considering both DIY models and more press-like models that offer editorial support. There are, of course, trade-offs between those different models and many factors to consider, like your capacity and your organizational capacity. And the takeaway there really is not to go it alone and to find support um, either at your institution or in groups like this to um, help you along the way. Then we started digging into project and program management when we learned about calls for proposals and how they're matchmaking tools between you, your program, and the author. The key takeaway there was to seize the call for proposals as an opportunity to communicate what you're able to offer prospective authors early on. And that brings us to today, continuing in the theme of project management and thinking somewhat chronologically in, in sort of the order of operations. Today, we're gonna to zero in on memorandums of understanding or MOUs for short, and how they can clarify your relationship and expectations when supporting publishing of any OER. An MOU is a really important part of any textbook project. Even if you don't see yourself building a publishing program, it's really helpful in clarifying expectations between everyone who's involved. So spoiler alert on a key takeaway from today, you will want an MOU regardless of what kind of support you're offering because it will help everyone get on the same page. So next week, we're gonna continue talking about project management and how to manage all of the moving parts while authors are writing and during the production and publishing phase. So we're still sort of in the ramp up phase of getting everybody on board, clarifying what, what the relationships are and what the program or project is gonna look like. And then we'll start transitioning next week into the authors are writing, um, you might be managing timelines or kind of thinking about that production process. So really, this is the second of three weeks dedicated to project management. So I've got a handy dandy poll for us, if you please, a little poll about MOUs. So please let us know if you have ever created an MOU in your past, and maybe you have and you can't remember, totally understandable. Uh, let us know if you've ever signed an MOU. Um, Again, you may not remember, but uh, if you have, let us know. And finally, uh, or actually not finally, number three, have you ever sat down and talked through an MOU with all involved parties? Maybe you were invited to that conversation or you organized that conversation. Again, maybe you don't recall, fair enough. And then finally, number four, have you ever followed up with someone about their obligations as defined in an MOU? Um, please let us know if you've had that conversation. 
I see responses still coming in. I'll give it a few more seconds. And the results you've all been waiting for. The majority of you have not created an MOU, but many of you still have. The majority of you have not signed an MOU. Um, and we're kind of split. If uh, you've ever sat down and talked through an MOU uh, with everyone involved, and about half of you have um, not ever followed up with someone about their obligations as defined in an MOU, and then um, the rest of you are split between I sure have done that and I'm not sure. So this is, uh, I think, really fun for both Carla and I to hear about because Carla can, can think about these responses as she talks about some of the common issues that come up when dealing with MOUs. Um, I'll say briefly, the call for proposals and the MOU do have a lot in common. Both are really communication vehicles. They're an opportunity to communicate your capacity and your program vision. Again, they're matchmaking documents. And there are several templates for both the call for proposals and uh, MOUs in our curriculum. So you do not have to start from scratch. Please jump off from what your colleagues have created before. And now for more guidance on MOUs, please join me in welcoming Carla Myers, Assistant Librarian and Coordinator of Scholarly Communications at Miami University Libraries in Ohio. Carla's gonna talk about MOUs, why they're important. And then after she finishes, we'll have a lot of time for questions. At first, those questions, um, let's try and focus them on MOUs, but if we do exhaust that topic, we can certainly open it up more broadly to questions related to copyright and Creative Commons. Um, Carla is a total pro at, at fielding those questions, and I know there, there are often many of them pressing in this OER space. So without further ado, Carla, I'll hand it over to you. Everybody, um, I'm so excited to be here to talk with you today and uh, go on a little bit of this journey with you. I was so excited to be part of Pub 101 last year, last semester. It's all blurring together, um, too, and uh, especially excited to talk about MOUs. Um, I was very interested to see the responses to the poll. It looks like we have a great blend of experience. For those people who haven't had a lot of engagement with MOUs yet, um, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. There are no stupid questions. Um, we all kind of learn this. We all start from some like basic points. Um, so as I go along, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them. And for those of you who have worked with MOUs before, share your knowledge, share your experience. Um, as I'm going along, be like, oh yeah, I had something like that. Let me tell you how that went. Or be like, hey Carla, you know, you're missing something. Here's, or so here's something unique we did at our institution. Um, I think that hearing from other people's experience is a great way to learn as well. So I encourage everybody to contribute. Um, thank you for the introduction, Karen. Um, so as coordinator of scholarly communications at Miami University, um, which is in Ohio, not Florida, um, uh, I do a lot of work with open educational resources. And especially as we rolled out our publishing program, um, the MOU, which kind of later morphed into a publication agreement, which will be interesting to talk about. Uh, but that's kind of my background um, working with these issues. So kind of how things have hopefully gone so far, or how things might go, is um, you've put out your call for proposal to communicate, here's what our publishing program might look like. Authors respond to that, and then as part of that process, you engage with the authors with their application to determine which project's going to be the best fit for your program. And like Karen said, the MOU is kind of the next stage communication tool. It is a way to communicate very clearly to the faculty, students, whoever is going to be authoring this. Here is what we are going to expect from you as a participant in this program. But also to communicate front to them, here's what you can expect from us. Here's what we are going to do as part of this as well. And um, we're going to go through the specifics of what this might look like. So an MOU is a Memorandum of Understanding. It's a formal, though not necessarily a legally binding document and agreement between two or more parties. Um, and it can be as long or as short as needed in order to effectively outline the goals and responsibilities of each party. Um, I would say for publishing, most of these MOUs tend to be around about two to five pages long. Um, I've seen some that are substantially longer. I've seen some that are 1.25 pages, um, pretty short. 
The nice thing about the MOU is it can be as long or as short as you need it to be in order to effectively communicate your goals. Um, one thing I think you'll find is that it tends to get a little bit longer as you go along as you think about new things you want, might want to incorporate into the MOU based off experiences that you have. So why have an MOU? Um, I think it has a couple different benefits. I think it sets the tone for the project as an agreement between the um, people involved. Here is what we want to achieve. Here is what we plan to do. Um, it formally sets expectations that we are outlining. Here's what you as the author or authors are going to deliver to us. Here is what we as the publishers are going to provide back to you. Here's how we are going to progress in things after the project is completed. And I think it also serves as a source document. So down the road, if there is confusion about something, um, maybe there was confusion regarding the budget, or maybe there was confusion regarding due dates or something like that. It's a source document that you can go back to and review with the authors in regards to what do we agree to when we started this project. Um, were expectations then accurate or based off our experiences so far as part of this project, do we maybe need to change something? But it serves as that base level for all of you to operate from. So, What's in your MOU? Um, the first thing you want to have in it is who is involved with this project? Who are the creators? And it's a good idea here to name all of the creators that are going to be involved. Um, a lot of times it's just going to be one, two, maybe three or four authors on the primary project. But there could be other people who might be involved. Um, maybe you're working with a faculty member who's going to have a graduate student um, who's doing some of the research or preparing some resources for them. Um, what I usually advise is what you want to have here identified is at least who all the primary authors are. Um, so you're aware of who those are and who you might be communicating with. Who you also want to think about is who is this agreement between in regards to the institution. Since a lot of libraries are the ones who are sponsoring the publishing programs, a lot of times these are between the authors and the library. Although sometimes the library specific publishing program, if they have one, is named as the partner. Sometimes too, it could actually be the institution itself the agreement is between, um, with the library or the library's publishing program being a member of that institution. So that's something you want to think about is uh, who is this going to be between. Next is what is going to be in the MOU. What key topics or points or goals do you want to talk about? As far as the people who are going to be creating content, what are their deliverables? Um, in regards to um, with an open textbook, writing the text itself, um, finding images to be used in it, creating figures or graphs or charts. Um, a key thing here to discuss ahead of time is who is going to be clearing permissions for the reuse of third party content. Um, sometimes authors kind of have the expectation, oh, well, my publisher is going to take care of that. And that could kind of be a really unfortunate surprise if they hand you a manuscript and all of a sudden they're expecting you to go out and get 100 permissions tied to that. Um, a lot of times, given the scope of work that can be involved with permissions, whether that is actually going and seeking permissions or identifying Creative Commons works that can be used within the OER, um, there is the expectation that the author will be doing that work. But as part of that, what do you want those permission agreements to look like if they are going to individuals or organizations and getting permissions? Or is there a certain type of Creative Commons license you want them using? Or how do you want them documenting the Creative Commons license? Um, I once worked with a faculty member and uh, I forget how many images they gave me. It had to be somewhere between 25 and 30. And they're like, oh yeah, they're all Creative Commons images I found on Google. They're okay. And I'm like, no, I need a little bit more evidence than that. Um, so we had to backtrack in part of that project, but really communicating upfront, what do you expect them to deliver to you? But then also to make it very clear, um, what are you um, going to deliver to them? Will you be helping them find contributors, maybe to write case studies? Will you be identifying peer reviewers? Maybe the um, OER textbook is going to go through a blind peer review process, and as such, you as the publisher are going to be finding those peer reviewers. Um, the content requirements, um, what you're expecting out of them, but what you will also deliver back. Um, maybe you're going to agree to do the indexing or something like that so they understand what's involved with that. And then, of course, as part of the publication process, what publication services are you going to be offering? 
are you going to be offering copy editing services or will they be responsible for that? Um, will you be going through and kind of doing the line by line final checking and read through? Are you going to be expecting them to do that? Or more likely, is that going to be a joint partnership? Um, so what you expect them to deliver as part of this project, but also being clear and upfront as to what services you are going to be providing them. I think it's a good idea to cover all of that in your MOU as well. When? Um, what is the project timeline? And I will tell you um, in working with authors on open publication projects as a journal editor, um, you have to be flexible in your timeline. Life happens. Um, you know, things come up either personally or professionally that as a result, these projects get shifted to the back burner. Sometimes it's for a while, a few months. Sometimes um, there was a realistic due date, but something happened and now they need to push that back a week. Um, I think it's good upfront to set timelines. However long you think initially it's going to take, I recommend adding about six months onto that to allow a little flexibility and leeway. Um, but making it very clear to the authors, here is the timeline we are going to start out with in regards to the content you are going to deliver to us. But then also, here's our timelines as your publisher to stay on track. Here's when you can expect us to return different stages of the publication process um, to return your manuscript to you or to update you on the different stages of the publication process. So discuss dates up front. Pad in a little extra time because I promise you're probably going to need it. Um, but this is one of the places that you're going to be flexible or want to be flexible. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, how? How are they going to deliver the content to you? What is the manuscript file format going to look like? Um, the vast majority of people are probably going to submit in a Word format, but can you be flexible in regards to like an open office type product? Um, what are the image and graphic file um, requirements that you have? Not only the file type, do you want JPEGs, um, but what is the resolution of those files? Citations. Um, I can tell you as a journal editor, being upfront from the get-go about here is a citation style that we are working with giving them lots of great guidance for citations. Um, I like to give our authors, excuse me, our authors sample citations. Here's what your book citation should look like. Here's what a journal citation should look like. Um, and of course, there's many valuable resources out there like the Purdue OWL for whatever citation style you're using, saying kind of go here to take a look at things. Um, but not only what type of citation style you're using, but that you really expect them to focus on submitting quality citations. Um, with a lot of the publication projects that I'm involved with, sometimes the citations end up being some of the most work. Um, if they're not accurately tracking their citations from the get-go, then having to go back, okay, where did the source come from? Or um, a very common error that I see is something is cited in the manuscript, but it's not included in the reference, so making sure they're including it both places. Um, and then the citation formatting itself. It's hard. It's a time-intensive process. It's a very exacting process. Um, I once got a, a work that had, I think, about five pages of citations. That doesn't sound like a lot, but the citations were all over the place. Some were APA, some were Chicago, some were just, I think, a made up citation format. And going through those line by line, one by one, to try to get them all into our preferred format was a huge undertaking that took us days. Um, so communicating upfront as much as you can about your expectations for how things will be submitted. Um, giving them examples wherever you can. Here's what a sample chapter might look like. Um, here is how you can check the um, image resolution of your images. Um, it's just going to, once they deliver it to you, allow you to hit the ground running instead of having to go back and fix a lot of things. Um, something else to have in your MOU is those copyright considerations. Um, so in regards to authorship, do we have one person authoring the whole entire thing? Is this what we might consider a work of joint authorship where two or more people are working together to create the work? Um, something we need to give a lot of attention to is, are students going to be contributing to this? And um, there's a couple considerations tied to this. I think first off, there are the ethical considerations. Um, and I've gotten some pushback from some of my colleagues about this, but I have serious concerns about students being required as part of a grade to attach a Creative Commons license to a work to be included in an open educational resource. 
And I get where some of my colleagues are coming from. They're like, this is a great way to create something that has a student voice and perspective in it. Um, this is a great way to get them involved and excited about open educational resources to raise their awareness of Creative Commons licenses. But I feel like if students are being compelled or forced to as a requirement, um, as part of the requirement for their grade to put a um, open license on their work, that we're taking that choice away from them. So something I talk with about faculty, um, with faculty members when they're interested in getting students involved, whether it's a class working on the OER or if they have students employees working for them, is um, let's talk about, let's have a very frank conversation with them about what Creative Commons licenses are, um, the benefits in putting this resource out there with the open license, but giving them the option not to have whatever their contribution is, if it's a chapter or something like that, they can still do that as part of the class if they wish, but not compelling them to put that Creative Commons license on it as um, part of their grade. Um, and then something else we have to think about here, which is a little outside the scope of copyright, is also FERPA considerations. If students are doing this as part of a class assignment um, that then may be protected by FERPA, and we may need to get a special release from those students in order to have it included in order to make that work public, if your institution considers that to be um, an educational resource. Um, and then there's work made for higher situations. With one of the OERs that we are looking at publishing, we are probably going to be hiring a graphic design student to create a lot of the components of that. Um, and what I've talked about with my bosses is I'm excited to get a student involved. I'm excited to have a graphic design student work on a project like this where they get a credit where after they graduate, um, they can go talk about working with a client and uh, being a contributor to a book. But um, as part of the contract, when we're hiring them, we're going to be talking about the works you're creating are going to be works made for hire. Um, the copyright will be held by Miami University, but it will be licensed under a Creative Commons license, and you will be given credit as the person creating that. So just kind of being upfront about what our expect expectations are and what they can expect from us in that work made for hire situation. Something interesting I ran into when I was working with my Office of General Counsel on our MOU slash publication agreement was looking for certifications and indemnities. Um, so uh, certifications that they are the rights holder, um, that they're not necessarily reusing works that they've published elsewhere and that maybe they've signed over those rights to another publisher as part of that. Um, that it is all their own original work except for where they've cited the use of third party works. Um, indemnities, things like, you know, this work is free from libelous material, or um, something we talked about putting in is that um, it would be free of information that they knew was intentionally misleading. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're not putting bad chemistry information here that will result in an experiment flowing up in somebody's face. Um, so just certifications that they are the rights holder. Um, and uh, indemnities that there's nothing libelous and the information to the extent of their awareness is truthful and correct. Um, and then of course the license, the Creative Commons license that is going to be attached to the work. Um, there's a couple different takes on this. I had a faculty member who uh, expressed an interest in being part of our OER um, publication program. I had thought from my perspective that we were making very everything very clear about the program and it being open resource. And then when I sat down to kind of go through the MOU with him, he's like, well, and what about my royalties? And I was like, oh, well, you know, um, we're giving you an honorarium because this is an open resource, there are no royalties. And he was like, Oh, well, you know, it's, it's, I thought there were going to be royalties and no offense if there's not going to be royalties, I don't want to do this. And he had a noble purpose. Um, he was hoping to use some of the royalties. Uh, one of his sons was getting ready to go to college and he saw that as another revenue screen, um, stream, but he didn't necessarily understand um, what the open licenses entailed. Um, so not only talking about as part of this program, you're making it openly available, but going through the different Creative Commons licenses. Now, if some OER publication programs say you have to use this one specific license, or maybe you have to choose from one or two or three licenses. Some publication programs say you can use any Creative Commons license. We don't care which one, you just have to pick one of them. But making sure they understand too, what is the scope of that Creative Commons license that they still retain the rights that people will be able to use their work under that um, Creative Commons license, or maybe in ways that comply with fair use if it goes beyond the scope of the license that they attach. 
And having that conversation about what license is going to be chosen, or more especially if your publication program requires that a certain license be chosen, or maybe one of three of the six licenses available, which ones those are. The budget. Um, here you want to talk about a couple different things. If you are providing an honorarium, what that would look like, how that is going to be paid out. Something you probably want to include is that maybe it's a one-time honorarium. Um, I had talked with a faculty member who was under the impression that they would get that honorarium every year. Um, so we had to have a conversation about, no, actually it's just a one-time honorarium. Some institutions give an honorarium in addition to a um, budget that's going to be used by the institution for to help support the publication side of it. Um, some institutions say, here is the budget, maybe it's X amount of dollars, and um, you can keep that as an honorarium for yourself. You can use that to hire people to help you with that project. Some institutions look for faculty members who are just merely interested in doing this to be part of the open access and open publishing. Um, uh, oh gosh, sorry, I'm tired. Um, to be part of this initiative and scope and um, to contribute to society in this way and don't offer any type of honorarium. Instead, there's just an internal budget to help support this. Um, so if an honorarium is being paid, how much is being provided, um, whether it's a one time fee or not. Um, how that is going to be paid? Is some of it going to be given up front? Is it all going to be given when the work is published? If there is a budget, um, is that budget going to be handled through the library? Are you going to pay out all of those funds? Um, if the person who is authoring the work, if they want to contract somebody, um, how will that payment be processed? Um, that's something you probably want to work with your library or institutional administration because at a lot of academic institutions, especially public ones, there can only be certain ways that those are done, or sometimes you have to work with certain university approved vendors to do certain things. Also, be very clear up front um, if the faculty member is going to be able to engage or bring people into this process to create things that they're going to be paid for, what type of expenses can be paid? Um, can you pay a student employee salary? M might be tied to that. Um, especially in regards to outside vendors. Does that have to go through a bidding process with the university, depending on how much that's going to cost? Um, so being very upfront about how much money is going to be involved in that project, if some of that is going to be given to the author or authors, in what capacity um, for them to use as part of publication or as an honorarium, and then what type of expenses that you can cover. Contingencies, um, contract revisions. A lot of times with MOUs, things pop up during the project that you didn't even think about. Um, all of a sudden, they think about bringing somebody into the project, maybe somebody with graphic design experience, because they now realize they don't have the skills needed in order to um, create effective and engaging um, graphics. Um, contract revisions in regards to publishing timelines. Um, again, it's very rare that authors meet all of their deadlines. Some absolutely will, and that's wonderful. But very frequently, um, they are not able to meet deadlines through no faults of their own. Again, you know, life happens, things come up. Um, although, keeping in mind that a contingency for a contract cancellation on either side. I have worked with authors who have had every good intent from the start of the project and then had some big life event come up whether they're leaving the institution for a new job or something with their family where they say, you know, I just can't fulfill my end of this. Um, also too, within the scope of the institution, I know the one thing we're hearing right now, um, and I'm sure you're probably hearing too, is budget considerations for our institutions within the scope of everything going on that is impacting us financially due to the, due to the pandemic. Um, the one thing I've been having a talk with my boss about is the money that's set aside for a publishing program, how that might be paid out for the rest of our fiscal year, what's that's going to look like for the next fiscal year. It could be that somebody we hope to bring on for a project in the fall, we now may have to hold off till the spring of 2021 to bring them in. Um, so in the extreme situation, contract cancellations on both sides. And usually what that might look like is um, cancellation for reasonable cause with a certain amount of notice. Um, the one thing to think about with um, 
contract cancellations is if any funds have been paid out ahead of time, whether that's an honorarium or a part of an honorarium or some expenses to the author or authors, um, if there will be any type of refund of um, those expenses or um, if those will just kind of be considered a wash. And again, that might depend on the situation. But I think it's very important to have that option in there for cancellation with reasonable cause and reasonable notice on either side. Drafting your MOU. Um, this is something I very much encourage you to work with your Office of General Counsel on at your institution. Something you want to think about is, um, would you be interested in working with them um, from the ground up to draft your own memorandum of understanding? Um, it's certainly an option, especially if you have an engaged Office of General Counsel. But the great thing is, through the Open Textbook Network and this program, we have a lot of great examples of MOUs that you can just swipe and customize. It's so much easier. Um, the great thing is that a lot of the MOUs you will find in the OTN Publishing um, Co-op um, Pub 101 materials, they've been created by other institutions, sometimes in conjunction with their Office of General Counsel. A lot of them have been modified based on experience and insight with the program. Um, so uh, I would actually encourage you to use one of those as your base template and then customize it to your institution. One thing to be aware of is specific considerations that might be tied to your institution. Um, for example, if faculty are unionized at your institution, you may actually have to bring somebody from the union in to work on the MOU or have feedback on that, especially if it's considered work beyond the scope of their normal job duties. Um, so that's one thing that your Office of General Counsel can usually help you identify, special considerations that you might not be aware of that might have to be worked into that MOU. Um, so uh, here are some links to some of the MOUs that are available um, through Pub 101, um, and they're all really good MOUs. Um, so tips and recommendations, use plain language. Um, in working with my Office of General Counsel, our MOU really kind of has grown almost to the point that it could be seen as a publication agreement. I think it's about eight pages long. One thing I was really, um, I was willing to work with OGC to have this longer MOU. But one thing I was really adamant about is that it should not be written in legalese, that we need to write this in plain language so that it is something that the um, people who are signing it, our authors, can understand what they're getting into. Um, the importance of organizing it logically, um, often you'll start off with here are the parties who are part of this MOU, um, here are the author expectations, here are the publisher expectations, and then here is the little special considerations, um, things that might come up, um, uh, you know, options for contract cancellation, and then there's usually a section dealing with budget as well. Um, so again, the sample MOUs that are available through the OTN, look through all of them. It's going to be a great idea of what different sections might we want to include in our MOU, and especially that draft language that you can steal to um, start with a basic or a foundation for your MOU. Setting expectations. Um, inform your authors and creators early on that an MOU is part of the process. I think this should be included as part of the call for proposals and not just letting them know that an MOU will be signed between the parties, but include a sample of the MOU so they can read through it and make an informed decision about it. Um, it could be kind of sad to have both you and an author very excited that, um, you know, they put in their application, you think they're a great candidate, you accept them into the program, and then they see the MOU and they're like, oh, there's something in here I'm not comfortable with, and then they back out of the program. Um, so as we've been talking with different authors um, about coming into our publishing program, not only do I share that copy of the MOU up front, but I often have a meeting with them uh, before we make a decision on their application to go through that MOU and say, I want you to understand what's going on here. Um, so the initial meeting is sharing the copy of the MOU, saying this is the agreement you would be signing on to. Um, I'd like to talk you through it very briefly. And then when somebody is accepted into our program with the signing of the MOU, we literally go line by line, section by section, and talk through it. And in some ways, I, I worry that I feel like I'm being very patronizing, but I'm like, okay, here's the first paragraph. Let's read through it together. Do you understand what this means? Do you have any questions? 
especially in terms of the expectations from you. Um, our expectations in terms of citations or file format. Um, I talked with somebody and they're like, uh, what's a JPEG? I'm not certain what a JPEG is. How do I go in and file form that? Okay, let's talk through and make that very clear so you kind of understand what you're getting into and be prepared especially in terms of budgets, um, especially in terms of copyright and permissions and what we expect from them when they go find Creative Commons works that they can include in that MOU. Um, just going through section by section and making sure, I don't want anybody to, sign, anybody to sign something that they don't understand and feel comfortable with. Um, and nobody has ever got impatient with me um, in going through this. In fact, most people are like, whoo, that took a long time and that was really kind of intense, but I'm glad we went through this and talked it all through. And then being available at any time, whether it's during the call for proposal stage, or usually what I do for the meeting is I say, okay, here again is that copy of the MOU. Let's set up a meeting to go through this and sign this, but please look at three before our meeting, make any notes so you have in mind any questions you wanna to talk to me. Always being available to answer those questions. Um, in regards to the MOU and just project management in general, some thoughts and recommendations I have for you is there's no such thing as over communication from either side. Um, again, I tell authors there are no dumb questions um, that I have gone through the publication my process myself, and whether it's for a book or a journal article. If you have questions or you're uncertain, it's better to stop and ask than to do the whole entire work and have to backtrack and correct things. So very much encourage the authors to ask all the questions they possibly have as they're going along. But um, I think it's wise too to have scheduled check-ins for book projects, even just once a month. Hey, how are things going? Um, to, you know, um, how are you meeting the goals that we out outlined in terms of the timeline? And the one thing I tell authors is if you're falling behind, if you're stressed, if you're feeling uncertain, if something has come up, tell me. Um, I promise I'm not going to get mad at you. Um, again, life happens. And if you communicate to me that you're falling behind, that something's come up, that a chapter you thought you could get done in three weeks is now taking six, okay, we can plan for that. I know what's going on. Um, I can tell you um, it's, it's harder when people go silent. And when people go silent, it's usually because they're embarrassed or they feel bad that they are not getting something done on time. Um, but when they go silent, I don't know what's going on. As versus when you talk to me that you've fallen behind or you're struggling with finding images you can use, we can work together on those. Um, using the MOU as a guide, again, not just are we meeting the deadlines, but how are your citations going? How are you doing with gathering that documentation in regards to um, the Creative Commons uh, tracking things? When questions or problems arise, going back to the MOU, what did we agree on? Or do we need to add new language to the MOU in order to address something that might have come up? Like they decide they would like to bring in a student employee after all. Um, having a conversation as part of the signing the MOU, or even as part of that like special exceptions part of the MOU, that the MOU can be modified um, upon agreement of both parties. What will probably end up being modified is some of the due dates, maybe even on both sides. Um, but where are you willing to be flexible and renegotiate, like in terms of due dates? Where can't you renegotiate? If your budget for a particular project is kind of set in stone, that this is the maximum budget. Um, and if something comes up that starts to push that budget, what is the considerations for that project? Um, so where can you be flexible and where are things a little bit more rigid in that MOU? Um, so all in all, it's, it's um, see the MOU as a tool for setting expectations, um, setting due dates, just as a way to kind of keep yourselves on track. Take advantage of the MOUs that are made available through this program, even if it's just for what are some key things other institutions have included, um, if you are going to start writing one from the ground up. But I think what most institutions do is go find those MOUs and kind of pick and choose between them and put together their own one. Um, not only is that a great resource to have access to, but um, draw upon the people in your group. Do you have MOUs that you've made or shared? Um, other people, um, especially through the listserv, talk about MOUs. Do they have examples? What are some considerations? I think one of my favorite pro things about this program and the OTN is that we are a community. Um, and by nature, we are people who like to share things and make them freely available to others. 
Um, so whenever I have thrown questions out, the group response has been amazing. Um, so if you see questions come up, not only as part of the MOU, but any part of this process, draw upon the expertise of people in this group and the other cohorts um, or the OTNs in general. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have about all of this. Um, we can talk a little bit about copyright within the scope of the MOU, or maybe if we have time at the end, we can do more general questions, or you can add those to the document and I can answer them later. Thanks very much, Carla. All right, well, um, speaking of drawing on the expertise of the community, there's been a great conversation in chat. Thanks to everyone for sharing your thoughts and your resources about honorariums, stipends, and the like. Um, as you think of your questions for Carla, I invite you to unmute or post them in chat, whichever you prefer. I will um, ask you, Carla, um, something that I think it was Susan posted. She just mentioned that with multiple authors, getting them to agree on a Creative Commons license can be an issue. And I was wondering if you had any experience with that or any recommendations for, for facilitating that conversation or just kind of letting, letting them work it out on their own. What are your thoughts? Sure. Um, so when it comes to the Creative Commons license, um, I like to have those discussions in person, whether it's physically in person or sometimes you do if there's multiple authors have to do it via web chat, um, to have that conversation up front. And sometimes you can have, um, you know, the primary author that you're mostly communicating with and then they pass information on to the other authors. But when it comes to talking about the Creative Commons license, I like to know that everybody's involved in that conversation. Because I have seen a few different disputes that one person wants a CC by, one person wants a CC zero, one person wants a CC by ND and C, you know, one of the most restrictive ones that they can have. Um, I've had, you know, people in the group, what's a Creative Commons license? Um, one of the biggest misconceptions we'll see around Creative Commons licenses is that they're giving their copyright up. And the great thing about the Creative Commons license is that you're not. Um, you get to keep your copyright, but you're allowing people to use it within the capacity of that license. So generally, with the MOUs, if there's multiple authors, I generally love to have everybody in the same room. Um, but uh, a lot of times you'll have a corresponding author who the vast majority of the communication is going through. But for the MOU and especially the Creative Commons discussion, I like to kind of make sure that everybody is on the same page and that they are on the same page before we even get started. Um, because when these concerns or questions come up about licensing at the end, you're just on that cusp of publishing. It's one of the last things you're doing. And now here's, you know, this whole conversation that you have to have. So I think deciding on what license is going to be used we include that in the MOU. Um, so we agree upon that license before we even get started and definitely making sure all authors understand what that means and are on agreement on the type of author that um, MO, uh, Creative Commons license that's being used. Thanks. Now, both you and Julie in the chat mentioned FERPA. Can you speak a little bit more to FERPA considerations when students are contributors? Sure. Um, so FERPA, um, it's F-E-R-P-A. Federal Education Rights Something Act. Um, so basically it has to do with the privacy of student records. Um, both K through 12 and higher education students are protected by FERPA. The thing with FERPA is each institution seems to have their own interpretation of what an educational record is. I think most institutions agree that an educational record is the student's grades. Some institutions think that assignments that are completed in class are educational records and are therefore protected by FERPA. The institution is not allowed to share them without the student's explicit permission. I know of some institutions who are like, no, assignments aren't covered under FERPA. Those can be freely shared. There's no consideration there. Um, so there are capacities of students' educational experience that is protected federally by privacy rights. And that um, something you want to find out is does your institution consider things like if students are authoring book chapters or maybe creating graphics or charts um, or collecting data as part of their education and getting a grade for that if that is protected under FERPA. And if your institution does consider that to be protected under FERPA, you need to get a FERPA waiver from them. 
And I promise you, your institution has FERPA waivers somewhere on their website um, because these are pretty common. But in addition to having the student um, sign a license, you know, agreeing to put the Creative Commons license on it, you'll also want to get that FERPA waiver from them. If your institution does not consider um, something like assignments or the creation of this to be protected under FERPA, then you don't have to worry about it. But again, tragically, each institution interprets that a little bit differently. So you want to find out where your institution stands on that. Thanks, Carla. Okay, I'm going to check in with you guys again to see if any of you would like to unmute or post your questions for Carla. Again, any copyright, Creative Commons, OER related questions are welcome. Bring it on. Um, I see a question from Sue. Is there a reason why you call it an honorarium rather than a stipend or a mini grant? Um, and a great thing to add on to this is um, our faculty actually get professional development funds. Um, so uh, kind of like Joshua said, um, the honorary tends to apply that the person wasn't play, paid out of obligation, but you are providing a recognition in terms of their time and effort. Um, stipends, you know, sometimes I see these words used interchangeably. Um, stipends for us are a direct payment into somebody's paycheck. Um, honorary, and so they're taxed. For us, honoraria are not taxed, but they likely have to report it on their income tax. I know if it's over $500, I know the institution will report it to the IRS. Um, many grants, sometimes tied with grants, um, there could be restrictions on how the faculty use that funds. So we award, um, I should have been more clear about this from the beginning, we give our faculty the amount in professional development funds which means it is free for them to use within the capacity of their job. They can use that to buy a new computer for their office. They can use it to buy a computer and new software as part of this project. They can use it to travel to conferences and events. Um, but that money is set to their department and is set aside for them to use in a professional development capacity however they wish. Um, so Sue, not only is that a great question and all the different connotations these words can mean, but um, also, talking very clearly up front, you know, this is coming in professional development funds. So they're not thinking they're getting that added to their paycheck, um, that they're going to see it in that capacity. Now, Carla, if they are given those funds as part of their professional development, does that mean that they um, are or are not tied to deliverables? Does it just kind of come in and then goodwill is, you know, expected and, and the, the OER will show up eventually? Sure. Um, so with our first project, we provided $5,000 um, in professional development funds um, with $1,500 to be paid up front and $3,500 to be paid um, upon publication of the work um, or transfer to the department upon publication of the work. One of the questions we have is if they don't complete the project, for whatever reason, would we expect a return of those funds? Um, one of the nice things here, if you want to call it nice, is um, what we came to the conclusion on that, unfortunately we haven't run into this, is if they had a good reason for not completing the project, um, you know, a very good reason. We had somebody who had a death in the family. Um, and so not only were they a primary caregiver for a while, um, but then everything they were dealing with afterwards. Um, so, you know, in that situation, we probably wouldn't ask for the return of the funds. Um, a good faith effort was made. We have some of the stuff they put together. Um, if somebody totally flaked out, we might ask for that 1500 back. Um, and the difference between something that our institution would consider a stipend that's put directly into their paycheck, we're not going after an individual to get that back. We can get that back from the department, if that makes sense. Um, but fortunately, we haven't run into that yet. Thanks, Carla. On this topic, Elle also mentioned in the chat that honorariums are one-time payments for volunteer services rather than payments over time and payments over time are typically stipends. So thanks everyone for chiming in on questions mm -hmm. cash. All right, we have a few minutes left. I'm checking in again. All righty, if there are no further questions, then we will wrap up today's Pub 101 session. 
Um, as a reminder, your optional homework would be to give it a go and uh, think about customizing your call for proposals or MOU template for your capacity at your institution and also within yourselves. Um, and then next week we will meet with Corinne Guimont. She's going to talk about project management as well, particularly what she's busy doing while authors are busy writing. And she will continue to expand on the timeline topic, which Carla introduced today. So yes, it's already started in the chat. Please join me in thanking Carla for joining us and sharing her expertise. As a reminder, uh, Carla is a member of the publishing co-op at the OTN, as are the other presenters you have heard from in Pub 101. So things do not have to end in a couple weeks when we start stop meeting formally. Uh, you're all invited to join the co-op depending on your OTN membership. I'm happy to talk to you about that. But um, wherever you find community, I, I hope you don't go it alone as you take on publishing support of OER. So thanks for joining us. And I hope you have a pleasant week between now and our next meeting. And uh, take care. Farewell. Thanks, everybody. Bye.